Okay, so basically what I'm doing today is um, a sort of symposium on the issues in management and this is something that we conducted uh, for our trainees and I must give my thanks to uh, the doctors from radio diagnosis pathology, radiation therapy and medical oncology who all contributed. Now, uh, as we know that uh, breast cancer is the number one cancer in women, uh, both in India and worldwide. Historically, uh, cervical cancer was our main problem, but uh, breast cancer has overtaken it now almost a decade. In various parts of India, that overtake has uh, been at different time frames, but now I think almost all over the country, uh, breast cancer is number one. And overall, if you look even worldwide, among men and women, it is the second most common after lung cancer and the fifth leading cause of cancer deaths. So about incidence, if you can see, we overall incidence in India is only around 20 compared to a country like the US, which is 100. And this is why uh, you know population-based screening uh, doesn't make sense because it's just too low to pick up on our population based level. So we have to target our screen programs. This is an estimate of incidence and mortality. If you look, just backing up what I said earlier, in men, lung is the number one, but women, uh, breast is number one overtaking the cervical and uterine cancers. Now, for a long time, people thought that uh, there was a difference genetically between groups, uh, the incidence of risk cancer, of breast cancer. But we know that that difference is mainly uh, lifestyle changes and uh, reproductive practices, that is the early menarche, delayed first childbirth and less breastfeeding, all this has contributed towards a change in the hormonal milieu leading to excess stimulation of the breast epithelium and cancer. In India, we can see that there's a rural urban divide. There's a, the rural population has a very low incidence, only about five to 10 per lakh, whereas urban is 30 plus. And towns are part of urban population. Rural means these are really the farming community, get up early, very active lifestyle. And um, they have a lower. So if you, even within the country, we can see as we shift to a more sedentary urban practice, then uh, which carries with it all the other risk factors that I mentioned. This was very nicely demonstrated also in the Japanese. The Japanese have a very low incidence, which uh, much of the world's researchers were interested in why they had such a low incidence. But we found that when they moved to the US, the Japanese second generation in the US had almost the same risk as the local Caucasian population. So it's basically, there's no real genetic difference in the incidence. It's really about the lifestyle modifiable risk factors. And the incidence of early and late also differs. Generally, people tend to come with later cancers. I alluded to this in my previous talk. Some slides will be common from if those who are listening attended the previous one, shows the early stage in India is only about 30 to 35%, whereas the locally advanced is the main group that we are dealing with. Even in our own experience, some old data showing stage, early stage is about half compared to locally advanced. Um, this is the stepwise pathogenesis. We know that you know it undergoes this series of mutations and change from normal atypwise progression from local disease to lymph nodal spread to systemic spread. So it was believed that if you did a maximum operation and you caught the disease while it was still local, you had the maximum chance of cure. So which is why the Halsteadian radical mastectomy held sway for a long time until Bernard Fisher came with his NAPP trials uh, and showed that actually it doesn't make a difference the extent of the operation. You could do a lesser operation with the same result because it is a systemic metastasis which was creating the deaths and determined the survival. And in his uh, hypothesis, they said almost 
all the cancers which metastasize, metastasize early, even by the time of clinical presentation. Now, as usual, you know, when theories swing completely from one side to the other side, the truth often lies somewhere in between. And that is well summed up by the spectrum theory, um, which says that there are different types of cancers. Obviously, some are early spreaders, some are late spreaders. And if you get the early spreader, then obviously by the time it clinically presents, it It, it is a spectrum. Uh, it goes on by the name of Samuel Hellman. Hellman was the one who first described this. Now, the rationale for screening, as you can see, is that this spectrum shows each of these layers represents a different type of cancer in terms of aggressiveness. So the higher top layer is the least aggressive. It takes a long time. It may even stay as DCIS. And some of them transform from DCIS to invasive much later, and so on. So till you go to the bottom where as soon as the cancer is formed, it's an aggressive invasive cancer and has gone into the system. So we are hoping to catch with screening some of the earlier stage groups, and that's where the difference will be made in survival by screening. Of course, there's a big controversy about whether screening actually benefits or harm. So it depends on what your baseline risk is. So in a country like India, with very low risk, then it, the chance of harm is with multiple ne negative biopsies and over treatment is more likely to outweigh the benefit of catching these early. Whereas if you have very high incidence in the population, then your likelihood of benefit is better. So this is still being debated even in the high incidence uh, populations. So definitely in a low risk population, it does not make sense yet to do population-based mammographic screening in India, and that is the consensus of the ministry and the experts. So I'll skip these slides, which I had gone through earlier, and just come to this one. Um, you know, most of us use the NCCN document, which is produced by the UH, uh, United States uh, National Cancer Network. And that has a very detailed uh, flow charts of how to manage breast cancer of various types and goes into very issues. Some of it we may notice may not be, you know, exactly applicable to us. So we must know, uh, you know, how to use this appropriately. So an uh, ICMR actually formed a team and uh, got together a consensus document for management of breast cancer in India. And this document is available free online. If you just put ICMR consensus document breast cancer, you can get a PDF document. It's worth uh, uh, looking at this. There are, it's not a very detailed document, but it's got some points like the one I've shown here. One of the traditional uh, problem areas has been how the definition of early versus late breast cancer. You can see, that in the early breast cancer of the original definition included T3 and N1 tumors. So technically a T3, which is anything more than uh, five centimeters. So if you have a seven centimeter mass with mobile lymph node, you still technically were calling it an early breast cancer, which sounds a bit odd because if you have a large seven centimeter mass. So in this document, uh, based on the Tata Group's recommendation, there was in, included large operable breast cancer, LOBC, which was the T3 lesion, either N0 or N1. So that tells you that it may be large, but in a even a six centimeter in a large breast may still be operable if the skin and chest wall are not involved. So they are called large operable cancers. Um, and locally advanced is restricted to T4 or N2, N3 uh, cancers. So that's an important uh, change in this document. The, the, the other document, uh, which is just coming out in the Indian Journal of Surgery is uh, from the Asian Society of Mastology. Um, the team of uh, Indian surgeons have put out um, recommendations on management and, and it's mostly India based. So these are useful to have as backups uh, when you have a doubt about the NCCN being a little over treatment in our context. Now, some uh, 
some issues about uh, one minute. Yeah, core needle biopsy is definitely. In all uh, BIRADS 5 and 4 lesions is definitely indicated. And in BIRADS 3, when the patient has additional risk factors, then it's better to uh, do a core needle biopsy. If you feel that uh, there are no additional risk factors, you can even do a short term follow up, usually six weeks to three months, not later than that. But you need to know your patient, and if you feel that the follow up is like unlikely and they may default, then it would be safer to even core the three lesions. So that you need to take that call clinically. So the core biopsy, there are various types of guns. This is an older gun uh, which could be reused. Now, a single shot gun is very uh, commonly used, and you can see an ultrasound picture of the core being done. If it's an impalpable lesion, then a wire localized excision biopsy is can be used. Now we'll move on to the pathology. If you have uh, the question of whether an FNA is okay, if you look at most high volume centers and a lot of guidelines now recommend actually doing core biopsy as your first uh, test because it gives you the additional information of immunohistochemistry and that provides you a roadmap for how to start the treatment whether it should be systemic new adjuvant given before surgery or whether surgery is okay and also gives you a prognostication uh, in the beginning so if whenever possible definitely a core biopsy with the receptor status is advisable now this is uh, an FNAC you can see of a, a very cellular lesion and some are looking a little more atypia in this one. This is a core biopsy showing how the core biopsy looks under the microscope here and you can see the lot of cellularity in the breast. This is a low power view. So just an example of a few biopsies. So the classification now we know that breast is usually an adenocarcinoma. There are very rare non-carcinoma types in the breast and is divided into in situ and invasive. The invasive, um, the in situ component is either ductal or lobular in origin. The majority are ductal and the LCI is only a few. The in situ carcinoma is appears uh, separate areas typically in lobular carcinoma in situ it tends to be multifocal we know that lobular invasive cancer also is multifocal now the important point is the invasive carcinoma under the pathology examination does not usually have any distinctive pattern so it is called not otherwise specified or more recently has been replaced as no special type, NST, not otherwise specified, which means there is no pattern recognition when you look at it under the microscope. Now, if there is a, a pattern, then it can be tubular, mucinous, medullary, papillary, for example. And these generally have a better prognosis than the not special type except the medullary type which sometimes can be the high grade triple negative that occurs in the brca this is an only exception of a special type having a worse prognosis than most special type the best prognosis of the lot generally is considered the mucinous and the close second would be the tubular here are the pictured examples. You can see how the pattern of each is formed in the lower three uh, examples. Now, the no special type um, carcinoma, which is the current uh, term NST, has been based NOS. Majority, 70 to 80% are no special type. When cut surface, you can see this typical white, there's a creating sense to cut and you may see small foresight of calcifications so the scoring for the grading is done like this so if you have 
uh, depending on the score, you can read it into one, two, or three. And the histopathological types of NST, depending on the well differentiated modern different tubular, this is also shows the three in pictorial format. The invasive lobular type tends to be a palpable mass and the mammographic density has irregular borders which are not very clear. So sometimes mammogram can miss uh, invasive lobular. That is one of the problems with lobular. And but usually is palpable when it's invasive and can be bilateral in 5 to 10 percent at presentation. The medullary carcinoma, as I said, uh, usually occurs in slightly older. Um, the morphology is described as soft and fleshy and more yielding to palpation. So sometimes the medullary, because it's very fast growing high grade, it may not induce much speculation around it. So it, as you can see in the mammographic picture, I mentioned in the last mm -hmm. talk as well, you can get it um, appearing, mimicking a benign lesion. So this is the one you have to be careful of. Here is the histopath appearance. This is the mucinous colloid type where the morphology is soft and rubbery. You can see the mucin on gross appearance as well in the specimen and tends to occur in older women, slow growing, and it tends to have a much better prognosis. This is the histopath appearance. They are arranged in islands and large lakes of mucin may be visible. This is the tubular type. You can see the well-formed tubules in the both the lower and high power view. And more than 95% of all tubular carcinomas tend to be ER positive. The invasive papillary or micropapillary carcinoma, this is a rare type and can be associated with DCIS commonly. And this is the invasive papillary the, is ER positive with favorable, progno, favorable prognosis, but the invasive micropapillary is, uh, can be aggressive and ER negative type. That's a rare type, but there's a small exception in the papillary that you have to be careful of. The metaplastic carcinoma includes a variety of types of breast cancer, matrix producing carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, and carcinomas with spindle cell component. So often these are triple negative, they're aggressive because the cells are changing their appearance. And this is the gene expression profiling, which we, um, many of you will be familiar with, but those who don't know you might, this is the basis for treatment of most cancers now. So when cancers were first studied with the profile of the genetic mutations in the somatic component, that is you take the tumor and assess the uh, genome of the cancer cell and you find a whole variety of mutations and you classify them into groups and see what the outcome is based on them. Then they fall into these groups, generally described as four groups, the luminal A, luminal B, basal and HER2 positive. So this is luminal A is the most common and the best type, usually ER positive with low uh, proliferation index. We use MIB or KI67 as the proliferation index marker. Luminal B means ER positive but has a higher index uh, of proliferation or it may have HER2 positivity associated with ER positivity. The HER2 positive is where it is ER negative but strongly expresses HER2. So that is the dominant receptor. Basal like is the which has three uh, receptors negative ER, PR, and HER2. It's also called triple negative cancer. Now, the information that was gained from gene expression profiling closely mirrors what I explained to you as the immunohistochemical profile. So if you use ER, PR, HER2 and a proliferation marker like MIP1 or KI67, then 
uh, you can get almost the same information as the gene testing. Gene testing being expensive, more than a lakh, two lakhs. This immunohistochemistry in most labs would be between five to 10,000. You can get almost the same information. That's been the really great advance in uh, breast cancer management. So using this receptor status, we can make prognostic uh, decisions as well as therapeutic decisions. So here's a pictorial representation, uh, luminal A, just to revise that, ER, PR, HER2 negative, luminal B, straddles both ER positive with HER2 positive or ER positive with a higher uh, index. Basal like is all negative and the HER2 overexpressed group. I'll just skip. Now, when we assess estrogen receptors, the estrogen receptor is actually in the nucleus. So the estrogen uh, comes into the cell, binds to the receptor in the nucleus, and then triggers cell proliferation. So the marker or the estrogen receptor marker stains the nucleus, as you can see here. We assign a score depending on the strength and um, number of cell stain, it's called the ALDRED score. So the ALDRED score is like this. First is a proportion score. That means what percentage of cells are stained. And then is the intensity score. How strong are they stained? So when you add them together, you get a score of eight. So if you have three, anything three and above, we say this is positive. One and two is taken as practically negative in the sense that hormonal therapy is unlikely to make a difference. Anything with three and above should definitely be treated hormonal therapy. There are arguments that any positivity should be treated even one and two. If uh, you completed the other treatment, it's better to treat them also. But the response is untraining, the better the response to hormonal treatment. So we say seven and eight score as rich. Now, HER2 receptors are also present on the surface. A normal breast cancer cell has only a few, these tyrosine kinase receptors, but the abnormal or HER2 overexpressed, as we call it, express too many receptors and they tend to bind to the ligands and set off cell proliferation much easier. Therefore, they become faster growing and more aggressive cancers. So here again, the IHC scoring in HER2 is 3 plus, 2 plus, 1 plus, and 0. Now, if the ILC score is 3 plus, then there is no doubt that this is overexpressed, and this will clearly respond to anti HER2 therapy, which is trastuzumab. If it is 0 or 1 plus, then almost clearly it is not going to respond. But the 2 plus is the intermediate category, which is unpredictable, and we need to do an additional test which is the FISH or fluorescence in situ hybridization. So this is an example of the HER2 strong three plus score. If when we do the FISH test, if that is positive, then we take that as a, a marker for anti-HER2 therapy. Some centers would routinely do both immunohistochemistry as well as FISH because there is a little overlap in that, few, few percentage overlap. So they use that, but it's an expensive test. So in India, generally we use IHC first, and then when we have an equivocal two plus, then we do fish as a second step, but it depends on each center's protocol. Now the pathology report must give what is called a synoptic report. That means you must give certain data that everybody agrees on. So if you don't have uh, all the these receptors you give a final pathological score. The staging workup, once you've done the core biopsy and then you understand, okay, this is the type uh, of cancer. Is it a, uh, so typically you will get an invasive ductal, 
with a no special type, maybe a grade two, and the receptors may come back as a ER positive or two negative, and the proliferation index may be low or high. So, based on that, you can actually plan the treatment. Before that, we need to do a staging workup. Now, this is another controversial area. How much testing do you really want to stage? What is very important before ordering tests is actually take a proper history and do an examination. So examination is not very useful in breast cancer metastasis because very rarely do they produce findings. But um, unlike say the you know bone met in a thyroid, you don't get those in breast cancer. You know, what you must do is assess the history for symptoms. Now for that you need to know that the most common site of metastasis is bone followed by lung, followed by liver. And these are the most common sites. Uh, ultimately, if you take patients, about 30% will be bone, 15% lung, about 12% liver. And much further down, about 5% may develop brain metastasis. So each of them will give characteristic symptoms. So you can typically pick up um, uh, metastasis with the symptomatic review. Now, in a, so if you have a symptom, then you must definitely target that um, system for your imaging. Now, in a, anyone more than T1, T2, we would definitely order this as a baseline staging workup, chest X-ray, ultrasound, bone scan. And additionally, if there is a doubt of lung findings or there is an x-ray finding then a ct of the chest and if there's a headache you do a ct mri of the brain and the rule of pet scan is the um, one well i'll just come to a little later now if you look at this graph uh, table it shows you that the prevalence of metastatic disease by routine bone scanning, liver ultrasonography, and chest radiography was very low when you look at stages one and two. So there is a limited indication for routine testing. So you know, I think anyway, for most of us, the X-ray would be done uh, as a preoperative workup. So that's not an issue. Uh, whether you need to really do uh, bone scan and uh, liver ultrasound, that brings up the uh, issue how often would you do it the role of ct thorax uh, many countries now it's ordered routinely as part of the staging workup um, in india again we have a selective policy again depends on the center you're working in our center we don't do it routinely but it definitely has a better sensitivity to pick up lung pets so advanced stage disease and any symptom in the chest we would definitely advise it it can pick up small lung mets it can show you internal memory nodes and usually the ct thorax includes the liver so you will really miss the liver as well the recommendations generally also say you when you do a ct you can combine ct thorax and abdomen therefore cover the abdominal structures down to ovary as well so the role of pet in uh, breast cancer, this is again a common problem. You may have patients or we have patients come and say, can I do a PET scan up front? Uh, then if it's a choice, then the, it becomes a difficult issue. But as a recommendation, definitely the recommendation is for advanced uh, cancers. It may be, uh, or to clarify whether there is a lesion in some other imaging like the X-ray or the ultrasound. So routine, a image staging of breast cancer by PET is not recommended because it tends to give a lot of false positives and picks up other inflammatory conditions, especially in our country, and you may be chasing something else. So can we avoid staging workup in patients less than two centimeters and a clinically negative axillary nodes, normal serum alcohol? There's a chance of finding metastasis is only one or two percent in these cases. Now we must remember that uh, if the patient uh, wishes and can afford, we generally do uh, staging workup in all patients. But if it's a cost-benefit issue, um, then you can omit 
staging but wherever you omit staging you must make sure that you take a good history of symptoms of metastasis treatment options for breast and axilla which one to choose modified radical versus breast conserving axillary lymph node versus sentinel biopsy so these are the issues now if there's breast conserving we generally choose a wide excision which includes as i said earlier the wide local level 1 oncoplasty or level 2 oncoplasty basically it's breast conserving surgery and the you need to excise the tissue with a gross margin up to 1 cm aim for 1 cm and usually this is achievable with a tumor that's up to 4 cm if it's larger you can give neoadjuvant chemo downsize it and then still do a conservation now the level 1 basically means you're removing the tumor with margins mobilizing the surrounding breast tissue of the pectoralis and out the skin and subcut and bringing the breast tissue the rest pillars as we call them to close the defect if you can do that uh, without distorting the breast too much then that is level 1 oncoplasty level 2 it's complex mobilization like we mentioned the techniques battering or um, benelli or weiss pattern or medial or lateral plaque these can be done this involves excision of larger amounts of tissue and more mobilization so there are issues that the breast will shrink you will get asymmetry and sometimes there are problems with where to place the clip and target the radiation in terms of the boost that the radiation therapists want to give so those issues have to be worked out in your mdt and you have to have a good understanding with the radiation therapist now the standard operation or the work cost in most of our centers is the modified radical mastectomy because most patients the majority of patients are are not suitable for conservation so here you remove breast pectoral fascia and axillary nodes up to level 2 or 3 and locally advanced uh, tumors will get new adjuvant systemic therapy first before the surgery if there are large operable then you can see logistically you could otherwise it is not doesn't appear there may be some insignificant nodes palpable and on ultrasound on assessment there is no uh suspicious nodes so we define suspicious nodes where there is either focal asymmetric cortical thickening or any part of the cortex is more than 4 mm in thickness then there is a suspicion there is of course if there's a node which is obviously hypoechoic and enlarged uh, and the overall size is 9 mm or more in short axis diameter that is yeah, also uh, those would be more obvious and probably palpable and round so if any of these criteria apply then they do not qualify for sentinel node biopsy now post chemo this is another issue can i do chemo a sentinel node biopsy after chemotherapy uh, when the last talk or question was asked so in an n0 staying n0 post chemo because you have given it because you had a tnbc in the t2 n0 case it was n0 started that you gave chemo in those cases you can uh, do a central node if it was n1 to start with and then becomes n0 you have to be careful i mentioned very selected you have to put in a clip marker make sure you get that out and any node positive means you have to complete the dissection so axillary dissection when done do you need to go only level 2 or level 3 the decision really is when you dissect the top of level 1 and you get into level 2 if you see nodes in level 2 then you must go one level higher which is level 3 level 3 is only a small amount of tissue medial to the pectoral is minor just below the clavicle so just make sure that there are no uh, nodal tissue left behind there if there is only few nodes in level 1 and level 2 anyway looks like it's only fiber fatty there are no nodes just stop at level 2 and you can complete your dissection the example that you should make your flaps clear i think i showed this last time 
post operative seroma is a, a major issue i think this is also we discussed that we um currently there is no full proof method to prevent a seroma so we we just say this is a natural follow up of surgery it depends on the extent of dissection the age of the patient the older more likely to get and if the patient has more body fat then also it interferes with lymphatic flow so it tends to collect the seroma for longer um excessive exercise also makes a persistent seroma so you have to tailor the amount of exercise according to the seroma accumulation now you can keep a closed suction drain with a waterproof dressing we our policy is generally to leave it there the average about 10 days one to two weeks most of them will come off if it persists then uh, the chance of infection is higher the longer you keep we may have to give uh, cyclical antibiotics i usually take off the drain at 3 weeks whatever and then aspirate the seroma um after that if it develops so i mean these are uh, vary between uh, surgical units so just go by your unit policy i don't think anyone can stand very uh, strongly on a particular method of management of seroma what we have to realize is you prevent it from getting infected so that what what has to be careful it has to be a nice sterile suction manage carefully and if there's any doubt please start antibiotics early uh flap necrosis is the other problem and then uh the result of conservation this is just a, a tongue in cheek sort of cartoon uh, saying this is an example of great cosmetic result but then finally the the impression of the result should be that what the patient feels so the cosmesis is what the patient decides so you have to be very clear uh, how you're doing it and what outcome the patient is going to achieve is better to show them some pictures of the possible result i think i showed some of these pictures last time this is a post wide local excisions yeah now we'll come to the technique of central node biopsy and the technique is to combine a technetium sulfur colloid injection with a um dye uh isosulfan blue is very available but in india we a lot of us use methylene blue there are other techniques which have been described uh, fluorescein and now icg injection uh, so wherever uh, you are you may use different techniques so the question is whether to use isotope plus dye or any dual technique as we call it uh, so this what is shown here is the isotope that's a gamma camera um which gives an output and that's the probe uh, which is handheld and pointed towards the um breast sorry one minute yeah so the the picture is the isotope scan which shows the tracer going from the primary site to the node and that's how you can direct your gamma probe and find where it is so you can make a small incision and then identify it by the blue dye so that's the ideal technique um we uh, in our experience we found very tracer quite expensive and logistically difficult so we use a technique of blue dye only and uh, we found it as good as the dual tracer so we continue to use it different centers have their own experience so it's best to uh, study your own experience and see what works in your hands this is an example of isosulfan and that's the node and but um, this is a, a study which was published comparing methylene blue only with the dual technique Uh, and found that there was no significant difference so there is enough justification to support uh, uh, methylene blue dye only although a lot of people uh, do feel strongly about using a dual technique i think each one has to um, find what works in your hands this is the example of methylene blue now once we have finished the primary therapy i think some of the issues around surgery are um the timing so in currently in our experience about 80% of our operation of our 
cases go for um, not eighty percent, sorry, sixty percent of operations have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and only forty percent or less may come to primary surgery. So it depends again on your MDT and how you discuss it. There are a lot of centers all over the world which are now treating all TNBCs, all HER2 positives, and all even some luminal Bs with a high uh, proliferative index with primary, uh, that is neoadjuvant systemic therapy. So uh, really only the luminal A early breast cancers will finally end up getting surgery first in many high volume centers. And that, that's our experience as well. But again, you have to tailor it uh, where, where you are. So these decisions have to be made, what adjuvant therapy. Now, just a small point about the term adjuvant. When we say adjuvant, what we mean is when we assess the patient, we only saw tumor in the breast and axilla. We didn't see any systemic, no metastatic disease was picked up on evaluation. So after the surgery, we assume that all gross disease is gone, but we are suspecting micrometastatic disease and therefore we are giving this additional or adjuvant treatment. When there is documented metastatic disease, then we only call it systemic therapy. So we say systemic therapy with an aim to cure or a systemic therapy with aim for palliation. Now, adjuvant medical therapy, there are some slides that just um, won't go into the details of these. You could ask. I think what surgeons need to know is that uh, uh, HER2 positive tumors, all of them need chemotherapy, and generally it's been shown that taxane with HER2 is the better combination. Uh, all the other categories, uh, triple negatives or high grade uh, ER positives, will require a combination of anthracycline and taxane. Usually four cycles of each are given. That's the most standard protocol. And there are multiple variations. The recent variation being the dose dense regime where they give it either every, in the standard being every three weeks, now they've gotten every two weeks or even every one week. The denser you get, the more effective it is, but also the higher likelihood of complications. So you have to balance it with the patients. These are the common regimes, anthra plus cyclone followed by taxane. In an ER positive only, uh, anthracycline uh, may be required if it is not high grade. And um, the least amount of chemo is given is just four anthracyclines. In a postmenopausal ER positive with slightly high maybe index, we may just give four anthracyclines. Um, in selected patients, taxane plus cyclophosphamide. So the indication for taxane is generally node positive disease and high risk node negative disease. The major chemotoxicities are these myelosuppression, febrile neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, mucositis, hair loss, and subacute and chronic effects like cardiotoxicity and neuropathy. So you're familiar with all these and you'll see the patients come to you with this. You may know how to recognize it and uh, refer them for the oncologist's opinion or treat them according to that. The HER2 targeted therapies that we have other than trastuzumab, lespertuzumab, lapatinib, and TDM1, which is uh, trastuzumab and tamsin uh, combined. Now, only trastuzumab is approved in adjuvant setting. The others are still uh, under trial. They've made a major impact on survival. So when these drugs came, first they were started only in metastatic disease. Then it's been shown trastuzumab in the adjuvant, that means non-metastatic also is useful. And the others are still to follow that. So I'll just skip to hormonal therapies, tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, uh, ebrolimus, fulvestrant, or fulvestrin plus palbociclib. Now, palbociclib is a new drug that's come in hormonal therapy, which is a cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor, type 6, 4 bar 6. So, this can be added to hormonal therapy and it's shown to be quite effective. So, especially in the metastatic setting. Now, the mode of action here you can see estradiol, how it acts, and in the nucleus. 
and activates a fully activated transcription and tumor cell division. Tamoxifen, the effectiveness over five and 10 years, right now the recommendation has moved from five to 10 years of tamoxifen. You can see the effectiveness in known positive and known negative, both they were effective. And the long-term effects of adjuvant tamoxifen 10 versus five years, there is some difference just achieving significance. So I'll just skip now to the role of RT. We have about 15 minutes and five minutes I'll stop and then we'll take questions. Now, the role of radiation is isolated local regional so, recurrence. Dr. Paul, you have time, no, no problem, you can carry on. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I also have to move by three. So uh, if you, if you uh, want me to continue, I'll do, otherwise I can move on to uh, questions and doubts. Now you can continue, finish I'll up continue. your lecture, so, then finish you can have okay. So radiotherapy is definitely indicated uh, in breast conserving cells. So the basic thing to think is, if you have done a breast conserving, you have to give radiation because the risk of a local recurrence after breast conserving without radiation is anywhere from 8 to 20 percent. So, uh, the, and it brings down the risk down to between 2 to 5 percent, which is still a little higher than uh, post mastectomy, which is around 1 to 2 percent, but not, they say, significantly different. So, we say that breast conserving surgery with radiation is not significantly different in terms of recurrence from mastectomy, which is what makes it equivalent. Now, you have to explain to your patient that before going for breast conserving surgery, that they have to undergo radiation. So, the problem you should not have is do a breast conserving and then the patient defaults radiation. So, that has to be explained up front. Now, whole breast radiation is given basically by two tangential fields. You can see this is how they plan the radiation fields and try to avoid the lung and heart as much as possible. So on the left side, the heart is closer to the chest. So there is an area where uh, conformal radiation, which is what is called 3D RT or even intensely modulated RT, achieve that effect of avoiding heart and lung radiation. So a boost to the tumor bed is also given in this situation where you've done a conservative breast surgery and you leave clips at the site of your conservation so that the radiation can target a boost there. The indication of post mastectomy, if you've done a mastectomy, when do you still need to give radiation? So any stage threes, if there's a T3 lesion, uh, more than four nodes, positive margins or high risk features. Now, this was the old criteria. Currently, there's a lot of evidence accrued that any node positivity actually benefits from radiation. So many centers have moved to radiating all node positive. You've done mastectomy and a node, even one node comes positive, there still is a possible benefit. You must consider radiation. So you add on, it's a good thing to think of radiation in terms of five fields. You've got two tangential fields to the chest wall. And if you're giving, if you've got uh, axillary disease that you need to boost, you have a posterior axillary boost from the back, and you have a supraclavicular field and an internal memory. So two tangential, posterior boost, supraclav, internal memory. That's five fields. So it's a combination of these, the minimum being the two tangentials, and the others are added on where required. So supraclav, if you've got high node positivity, and your posterior boost if you've got perinodal extension or incomplete dissection and internal mammary chain for any medial quadrant tumors. So that those you add on those fields. That's an important thing to remember. So here you can see how we depict the two tangential fields and the um, dose. Now the big change that has happened in radiation is what is called hypofractionation. Now the term means that less fractions. So traditionally it used to be given in five weeks or 25 fractions. And now it has been shown that three weeks or 15 fractions, um, that means each fraction has a higher dose. So you give this similar amount of radiation in 
lesser number of fractures or sittings. So it saves the patient two weeks and now is being trialed two week uh, radiation and even one week radiation. So uh, slowly all centers are trying to pull down the duration of radiation that will have huge benefit for treatment and uh, you know logistics of care in radiation centers. So currently most centers say three weeks is the standard. So we're looking at two weeks and one week as well. So here is the scenario. Altered fractionation can also be given by accelerated partial breast irradiation. So by putting in these brachytherapy wires, you can give radiation into the breast. And then there's palliative radiation. So I'll stop here. I think I'll take a few questions. If you have any, um, I'll have to finish the post piece. So I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, sir, again for an extensive uh, description. Um, anyone who wants to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand and uh, you can ask questions. JK, what, what is that? Sir, what is the treatment when there is already pleural metastasis, sir? And how does the spread happen to pleura? Yeah, so um, usually they are lung, so you can have peripheral lung parenchyma with secondary pleural involvement or you have primary pleural involvement where effusion will be the major effect. So if there is primary pleural involvement with a large effusion, then uh, even uh, pleural drainage and uh, radiation can be given. But the primary treatment is uh, chemo. Yeah, DSN. What is your question? Trial based and is not standard therapy. Yes. Hello. Sir, suppose uh, in a patient with triple negative CA breast yeah. who has undergone MRM and full cycle of chemo and RT. Yeah. On follow up, uh, there is some uptake in the internal memory node region only on PET yeah, on follow-up. This is after either, yeah. triple negative, chemo has been given, surgery and radiation, is it? Yeah, all three done. Yeah, so full treatment and now you are... Yeah, it was a T2 tumor, T2 N1 tumor. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, like on follow-up, PET-CT was done after five months. Actually, yeah. we planned to remove the chemo port. Mm -hmm. So, before that, a screening was done. Yeah. So on that, only PET-CT showed some uptake in the internal memory node region. Yeah, only but, internal memory. Yeah, yeah okay. but was, there was no lesion visible in either ultrasound or a CECT thorax. Okay, there's some uptake, but you got, uh, yeah. it, it has to be seen on the CT thorax. And it's unlikely that it will have uptake without. Okay. So is it a possibility of a recurrent match or how can we deal with it, sir? So typically, if it was a medial quadrant tumor to start with, then there's a higher likelihood of internal memory node involvement. So you have to assess the imaging. See, again, PET is, has a lot of pitfalls. So okay. if you uh, assess with the radiologist properly the PET and the CT and correlate that there is a structural lesion with uptake, then you have okay. to biopsy that lesion and prove that if, okay. if it is only a single lesion, then you biopsy it and show whether there is actually metastasis or not. You can do a target okay. biopsy CT guided. They have given there like is, it is a conglomerate lesion. Yeah, so that sounds like it may. Conglomerate means it will be it will be on the CT. So if you target biopsy and show that it is metastasis, then you have to go to second line chemotherapy. And if you have okay. not given the internal memory field of the radiation, you can give radiation to that area. Okay, so but what if uh, biopsy is not able to be done, sir? We are unable to take the biopsy because when we tried both CECT and ultrasound, it did not pick up the lesion. Okay, then we, uh, your, your consideration is to go anyway because it's TNBC, it's high risk. Um, okay. you, you want to do straight away a second round um, of chemo and then reassess whether there's a response that okay. can be done. Or is there any role for surgery like? dissecting and removing those nodes if you can't see it on ct or ultrasound then um, probably not 
I think I don't think there's a role for surgery. If okay. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sir, is there uh, any role of TNBC breast cancer having mets in the kidney? Like nowhere else in the body. Yeah, kidney can occur only usually at a late stage when there's very widespread. And if you have a kidney lesion, only hot, it's most likely a primary kidney. Okay. Yeah. So you'll have to okay. biopsy that separately and and you think that it might be a separate kidney, renal primary. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Paul, there's some questions in the chat box. If you can open the chat box and see. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, so we've got uh, common met is yeah bone first, then lung, then liver. Correct, and fourth is brain. Thirty percent, fifteen, twelve, and five. You can remember that as the percentages. What is the explanation why most common met is bone more than lung than liver? Okay, that's <laughs> nobody knows the answer to that. Uh, there are lots of theories. The a very interesting uh, point is. If you look at what is the largest volume of tissue in the body, it's skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle, but you almost never see metastatic skeletal muscle. So there is some reason why muscle is resistant to metastatic deposit, and we don't know. There is research going on. If you could find what that is, then that will also help prevent mets. But that's that is uh, hopefully you can take that up for your research question. Reactive lymph node. What is the question there? I don't know what is the question. This is a reactive lymph node. Uh, when to operate upfront and when to give near given chemo for LOBC? Yeah, so large operable. If the patient is keen on conservation, then that is the one uh, to give the upfront chemo. See whether you can downsize it and then uh, operate. So that that would be near given. Do or if it's a TNBC or two positive, anyway you have to give. Do all radiologically suspicious nodes require FNAC preoperatively? Um, no, only if you are considering um, central node biopsy. So, if you, even if it looks ultrasound suspicious, the sensitive specificity is only 60%. So, it's possible that uh, FNA may be negative. For met in that case, central node still can be done. That is when you will do FNAC. Uh, which has the worst prognosis, TNBC or HER2 negative? TNBC is the worst because now HER2 negative has treatment as well, specific treatment. Uh, muscles don't have meds because of high metabolic rate and cerebral meds can't survive. I feel, yeah, that, one of the theories, but nobody knows. Okay, I think it's almost three o'clock. I have to shut down now. So thank you very much. And Thanks. Thank you, sir. Again, we'll see you tomorrow at this same time. Right. All the best. Thanks for your time.